From its origins, Rome has been the great theater of the world, scene of encounters among peoples and cultures. In the heart of this millenary city, around the tomb of St. Peter, was erected the Vatican city-state, guardian of the Vatican's apostolic library, privileged place of the historical memory of humanity. Known simply as La Vaticana in Italian, or the VAT in English, the Pope's library is the only personal property the pontiff inherits at the moment of his election. But this institution as we know it today was born in the 15th century, at the apex of Renaissance humanism. Its patrimony covers a time period of more than 2,500 years, represented by numerous areas of study, like literature, theology, and the sciences, as well as history, art, and medicine. It's precisely these origins that make this institution a reality open to the human, and therefore open to culture. The history of the Vatican's Apostolic Library is understood by seeing the character and contents of this library. Contrary to what is thought of the Vatican's Apostolic Library, it is not a religious library as such. It was born during the Renaissance period, founded by a Renaissance Pope, Nicholas V, in 1451 who sent people out to gather manuscripts, of which many were of the Bible, but also about so many other matters. And it was the Pope of the Sistine Chapel, Sixtus IV, who founded the Vatican Apostolic Library formally in 1475. I would say that the importance of this library, noted in the entire world, is what it offers to humanity culturally. It's an infinite wealth. For the inestimable value of the library, in 2007, the Sanctuary of Culture Foundation was born, responsible for helping to preserve the treasures it contains, the tangible expression of the history of man. The uh, foundation is actually the uh, child brain, or brainchild, of uh, Pope Benedict XVI and Cardinal Raffaele Farina, who I believe is also on this program. Um, it was founded specifically to help the Apostolic Library to not only uh, fulfill its mission that is given to it by each succeeding Pope since about 50, 1451, but also to uh, share its uh, treasures with the uh, world beyond uh, uh, not only the Vatican or the Catholic Church, but the world in general. So uh, the purpose of the foundation is uh, twofold. One of them is that uh, Pope Benedict had asked me to find it, to found it, and um, in founding this foundation, he was very specific that there would be only one American priest um, in charge of it, and the only one that will be in Rome, and the rest will be American prelates, priests, and laity. In fact, the majority of the foundation members of the rectors are lay people. And these were uh, to uh, get together on a regular basis, uh, identify the needs of the Apostolic Library, uh, select from those needs programs that should be implemented or uh, that should continue uh, or encouraged, and um, 
rely on the generosity of the American people, which has been always tremendous in the past. And of course, we have to rely on divine providence. The second aspect of it is that there is a school here, very famous. And so um, we uh, supply um, funds uh, for two scholarships called uh, Gregory the Illuminator and also a chair, Pope Francis chair. And that chair brings about the uh, most prominent scholars from around the world to give academic presentations. Under the attentive guidance of Monsignor Lawrence Spiteri, the Foundation dedicates its efforts to the restoration, collection, study, preservation, investigation, digitalization, and promotion of works of or related to the Vatican Apostolic Library. My role is in a way threefold. I'm the CEO, I'm the chaplain, and I'm the one that I suppose is um, entrusted with um, keeping the pulse of what is needed here to always be focused on needs that are not only uh, um, real, but also uh, the spending of the funds is done in a way which is very accountable, according to the United States law. If it can be said that the Sanctuary of Culture Foundation was born of European minds, it's equally unequivocal that it continues its mission thanks to the generosity of a group of North American philanthropists. Looking at the uh, foundation, the Sanctuary of Culture, uh, it has been uh, strongly based in, in America uh, because we felt the Americans would be very interested in and being uh, donors and also supporters of moderi modernizing uh, the Vatican Library. And they've been very, very helpful in the few years that we've had uh, the, the foundation uh, in the sense that uh, we've been able to digitalize over 600,000 uh, pages already, which is phenomenal. I think one of the things we have to remember when we look at uh, our culture is that the richness of our culture and the future of our culture is really in our history. Uh, one of the great things uh, that we uh, often forget is that uh, the richness of the past, both its uh, successes and failures, uh, its victories and losses, uh, its insights into experience are so uh, great and so important for us, for our future and for our own uh, sense of purpose and vision uh, that uh, we can't discount uh, what uh, the Vatican Library can offer us. With the support of the Sanctuary of Culture Foundation, the Apostolic Library has made a commitment to preserving the incalculable treasures it contains and offering them to generations to come, also digitally. That's where the library's state-of-the-art data center comes in. Fundamentally, there are two objectives. The distribution, that is, being able to share the manuscript, to publish the manuscript for a great number of people all over the world, people who can see, observe, and sometimes even study the manuscript directly without coming to the library. The other is that of conservation. This is also a fundamental point because, just as for 500 years, the Vatican Library has been a library of conservation of manuscripts, of texts. In the same way, now we have the arduous task in the digital era of maintaining and conserving the digital assets over time. Fino 
Up until 8 to 10 years ago, the manuscripts were jealously kept inside the bunker of the manuscript deposit and were given to researchers who came to the library only for the time necessary for study and consultation. So, with the digitization, the mentality has changed a bit and so the manuscripts can be shared with the entire world. We can also receive studies carried out by people who are on the other side of the world, who don't have to come directly here to the library. A special thing is that through the publication on the site of the digital library, we have the possibility of zooming in on the manuscript, for which perhaps I could go and see digitally more particles than I couldn't see with the naked eye. From among its many supporters at the end of 2006, it was the American businessman, Mr. Frank J. Hanna III, who gave the Pope's library one of its main jewels, the 1415 Bodmer Papyrus, handwritten documents from between the end of the second and the early years of the third century AD. In January of 2007, Mr. Hanna and his family traveled to Rome to personally deliver them to Pope Benedict XVI during a private audience. Since then, the 1415 Bodmer Papyrus are known as the Hanna Papyrus I, Mater Verbi. But how was it that this papyrus arrived to the hands of an American entrepreneur? During a visit to the Vatican Apostolic Library, a team from EWTN was able to speak with Hannah, who told us how it came about. I'm Father Mitch Pack, and we are in a garden outside the Vatican Library. And we're here to talk with Mr. Frank Hannah. Mr. Hannah, welcome. Good to see you. Thanks Good for to having see me. My pleasure. And we want to discuss a very important uh, acquisition you made possible for the Vatican Library. It is known as Papyrus 75 to most scholars, yes. but uh, the, since this gift has been actually named after you as the Hannah Papyrus, what did you do to get this papyrus? Tell us about the uh, way you brought it into the Vatican Library. Well, it's it's an incredible story, really. Um, I like to think of the papyrus as the Mater Verbi papyrus, mm -hmm. uh, which is the way I've thought about it at the beginning, the, 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 the mother of the word, because this papyrus, one of the most significant pieces of it is the prologue to the Gospel of John, which is the logos, the word. Uh, in the beginning was the word. Um, like so many blessings in life, uh, this one sort of fell out of the sky. Mm -hmm. Prior to hearing about this papyrus, I knew there was a Vatican Museum. I didn't know there was a Vatican Library. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that this library had gone back centuries and housed the oldest Bible in the world, the Codex Vaticanus, and housed all kinds of other precious antiquities, I didn't know. Yeah, and but, so folks understand the Codex Vaticanus, the uh, uh, beta, is the, like you say, the oldest manuscript complete, we have of a complete Bible. Yes. It goes back to the 320s AD. Exactly. The time of Constantine. Yes. So I hear about this from actually a gentleman who lived in Long Island, New York, who had done business deals with my father in Atlanta 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he said, I understand your family's sort of involved with the church, that you're interested in the church. Uh, the Vatican's interested in acquiring a papyrus that has the oldest copy of the Lord's Prayer in existence. Mm -hmm. Would you be interested? Now, I've been involved in the church and things like Catholic education and stuff like that, but I, I didn't know anything about this. 
So I started learning about it. I started saying, well, why is this so important? I found out that Pope Benedict was intensely and acutely interested in the Vatican, Vatican obtaining this papyrus. Papyrus was used in ancient times as a surface to write upon, created from the pith of the stock of the Chiparis papyrus, or paper plant. The Hanna Papyrus I Mater Verbi, formerly known as the 1415 papyrus, is part of a group of 22 papyri discovered in Egypt in 1952, among which are texts of the Old and New Testaments and works of primitive Christian literature. But it's the importance of the content that gives an additional value to the papyri donated by Mr. Hanna. In complete coherency with the order of the Gospels dictated by the Codex Vaticanus of around 330 AD, the Hanna Papyrus I Mater Verbi includes the oldest version of the passage of the Gospel of Luke to the Gospel of John. Moreover, they include the oldest existing versions of the Our Father and the Prologue of John, the essence of Christianity. The Prologue to the Gospel of John, I mean, it, 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 it's language that's so poetic, and yet it summarizes the entire Christian faith right there in that prologue that, as you know, we used to recite at the end of Mass, mm -hmm. okay, because it sums it all up. In the yeah. beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is, this is the answer to man's mystery of life. This, yeah. is, this is the answer to our existential uh, reason for being here. Exactly. And, and there it is. And there's the oldest copy in the world. So at yeah. some point, you know, I kind of struggled. Am I really called to this? Um, and I, I prayed about it one day, and I thought, you know, we have one God in the universe. He came to earth. His son came one time so far, with the second coming, but, but he's been here one time. He taught us one prayer to pray, the Lord's Prayer. And this papyrus contains the oldest copy of that prayer exactly. in the world. Exactly. Um, the, and, and I thought there's, there's one place for this to be safeguarded for eternity, and that's here in the Vatican Library. And, and as I thought about that, you know, one of the things I've learned about discernment is if it leads you to a sense of consolation and serenity and, and peace, then that's probably the course you needed to take. And conversely, I thought, you know, if we don't do this, if we don't pursue the acquisition of this papyrus and it falls into other hands, a private person who just puts it in a collection or something like that, something will be lost to the world. Um, so that's, that's what led us to say, yes, we, we need to be part of this and we need to help bring it to the, in, to the library. In the voyage through time, the different world cultures have developed, encountering new realities and uncovering new insights to better understand humanity. Nowadays, the Apostolic Library embraces new technologies, thanks to which today's humanity can take a discreet look into the past. And this intimate encounter with history is what characterizes the ordinary work of the photographic laboratory of the library. And as this manuscript is in our library since uh, 2006, I think, mm -hmm. but there are parts that could not be read because of fading of ink again. I see. And the ink seems to be a vegetal ink. So uh, <sighs> actually, it, it's very easy to, to, to detach from the papyrus. Uh, in this case, there has been also done some multispectral imaging, what I would like to show you. So we uh, photographed with infrared radiation yes. In yes. at three different um, wavelengths mm -hmm. uh, in order to 
get access to texts that are hidden, in, like in this case, as you see, it's, it's because very there dark. is it, it, it is it's dark. Too dark to read. Very Sorry, easily. it is dark because there are the rests of an ancient leather binding that are glued to the papyrus fragments. Yeah, it's stuck, uh, stuck on. Exactly, yeah. and they cannot be uh, removed. Removed. Yeah. It's too. Uh, dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So if you remove the leather that's blocking our vision, you'll also remove the ink that exactly. we want to see. <laughs> exactly. And in this case, the infrared imaging uh, permitted to read texts that had not been read before. Yeah. Now to, and to think that this is a manuscript that is about 1900, or almost 1900 years old. That's truly... And weird. very important for Christianity. Yeah. So, ultraviolet imaging of the papyrus uh, gave the possibility to detect other things. As you see here, this is a normal RGB image. Mm -hmm. This is the ultraviolet image. I see. You see here there are some yellow uh, reflectances. Mm -hmm. This means that probably there has been some intervention of uh, conservation, of consolidation. S that's why preserving the manuscript, the, in this case a papyrus, as it is, and waiting for the science to catch up sometimes. Mm -hmm. This is what we do. And exactly. And again, I can't thank you enough for showing us how this process works and the, the tremendous work. I know there's much more. I mean, you've got books you can't read unless you put it through mm. here. It's fantastic. Mm. And the great service that you provide here is much appreciated. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much thank for you showing for coming us. Thank you. And for being interested. The Sanctuary of Culture Foundation isn't limited only to the promotion and the protection of the collections present in the library. Its mission goes well beyond that. In fact, the majority of its efforts are dedicated to the work of restoration, damage prevention, and conservation of papyri, manuscripts, and incunabula, that is, books printed during the earliest period of typography. The Restoration Library of the VAT, as we know it today, was born of the will of Leo XIII at the end of the 19th century. His determined resolve was to forever save and protect each item present in the Apostolic Library from physical, chemical, or biological damage. Restoring a book doesn't mean to make it new again. Precisely during restoration, one attempts to conserve all of the tangible materials and the historical material that can also transmit damage. For example, we do not want to take away this stain because it didn't create any damage, and it helps us to see that the book was greatly used. It's normal to reintegrate the paper with the paper, but only the writing support is restored. None of the text is filled in. The ink is never filled in. It would be doing something false. I always use this example. It would be like putting arms on the Venus di Milo. It is true the Venus had arms and certainly carried something in her hands, but we don't know exactly. It would be the same if we were to fill in the text we would be creating something false because we don't know what was written there in reality. Through the years, conservation has been the other very important part of the work of the Restoration Lab. We 
We are also a conservation shop. As with health, it's better to conserve, to prevent rather than to cure. Therefore, it's better to conserve before arriving to damages. And one of the problems that also concerned the library since the 15th century, since its foundation, was the insects. Uh -huh. Bugs that eat books. Yes, exactly. We use an anti-insect system that is called the anoxic system. That is to say, we put the books inside a bag. Inside this bag, there is no oxygen. We extract the oxygen and leave the book inside for 21 days. And after 21 days, the insects die. With the aim of supporting the restoration and conservation efforts, in 1983, in the underground galleries of the library, a vault was constructed where the oldest and most precious manuscripts have been stored. Protected by constant temperature and humidity controls, the Apostolic Library has successfully slowed the natural process of deterioration these volumes would be subject to in non-ideal environmental conditions. Today, the irreplaceable treasures housed in this vault are being relocated to another vault, equipped with the latest climate control technology. The new vault has been completely funded by the Sanctuary of Culture Foundation. In the Vatican Apostolic Library, the most elevated fruits of human thought are found, and the love for literature and the study of history come together with the desire for God. Everyone is welcome here. We don't care about your religious background, your educational background, your social status. The library belongs to the world. Its treasures, technically speaking, though they belong to the Holy Father, are entrusted to him for civilization because he is a library of libraries.